Welcome to Wildcard Wednesday. Uh, so we're taking a look today at uh, the ABCs of Hours of Service. I am going to pass things over to Kyle Dodsworth. Uh, Kyle, thank you for joining us here today on Wildcard Wednesday and take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Ben. But we're going to do a, a brief uh, overview of hours of service. So we're basically going back to uh, to the 80s here because that's when hours of service first was released. So this isn't something new. It's actually not something that's connected directly to the, the new ELD mandate. Uh, the ELD mandate basically is another layer on top of hours of service. Uh, so hours of, hours of service has been something that's been around quite a while. And we're also going to do this from um, a high level of the federal hours hours of service. So we're not going to get into some of the more, let's say, oddball types of hours of service that you might see with different states or different industries. We'll briefly touch on them, but we're going to take a look at this for more so the federal hours of service. And, and as most people know, there are lots of different exemptions and changes and differences as you go between different states and industries. But we're going to take a look at this from the federal side, just because it is a little bit simpler. First things first, though, is let's talk about some of the acronyms that we're going to be seeing throughout the presentation. So hours of service, we usually uh, bring that down to just HOS. Inside of hours of service, you have things called records of duty status, and those are usually down to uh, RODS. Uh, the FMCSA is the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. The DOT is the Department of Transportation, so the FMCSA is part of the DOT. DVIR is uh, Driver Vehicle Inspection Report. We'll talk about that. AOBRD is an automatic onboard recording device. Uh, those are the precursors to ELDs. Those are things that have, have also been around since about the 80s that you can no longer install, but you can still use them if they were installed prior to December. ELD is electronic logging device. Uh, CMV is a commercial motor vehicle. And then the last four there are, are all acronyms that are specific to the ELD records of duty status. So off duty, on duty, sleeper birth, and drive. So just to get those out of the way, and again, this is also a presentation that you can have access to. So if you ever want to know what these acronyms are when you see them um, inside of the system or on the blog or something like that, you can always ref reference them here. So hours of service, what is it and why the heck does anyone care and, and why is it required? Well, if you're a driver of a large heavy truck, so something that, that weighs 10 to 20,000 pounds, or it's a truck that is pulling something that weighs 10 to 20,000 pounds, you have a lot of responsibility as you drive down the road. The biggest concern here is about safety. So the main reason for hours of service regulations dating back to when they were first uh, enabled uh, back in the 80s was to keep fatigued drivers off of public roadways. The idea was that we know drivers get paid for the amount of time they drive, so they want to maximize the amount of time they drive. Uh, the hours of service was designed to sort of curve that a little bit uh, to make sure that drivers weren't overextending themselves and driving for 24 hours straight. So these regulations, they put limits in place for how long you can drive, uh, basically to make sure that you can stay awake and alert while driving, and reduce the possibility of driver fatigue and reduce the possibility of accidents. That's the, the main goal from the FMCSA. So who needs to comply with hours of service? Well, you need to comply with hours of service if you drive a commercial motor vehicle. There's that CMV. So what is a commercial motor vehicle? Well, in general, it's any kind of vehicle, a truck or a truck tractor with a trailer that's involved in interstate commerce and weighs more than 10,000 pounds on its own or has a combination of 10,001 uh, pounds or more once you look at what it's towing, what it's carrying. It's transporting hazardous materials. So if you see those, those trucks that are driving down the road and they have uh, the hazmat signs uh, on the bed or, or on the cab, uh, those would be considered a commercial motor vehicle. And if you're transporting 16 or more passengers, including you, you're also a com commercial motor vehicle because at that point you're a, you're a bus or something like that. So those are all different definitions of a CMV. So when you look at this slide here, you would obviously say that, yeah, the guy on the right, that's a big truck tractor with a, a big trailer, definitely over 10,001 pounds. So that definitely is a CMV, a commercial motor vehicle. No questions there. It's something that is very obvious. But on the left, You've got maybe a landscaper who is pulling a smaller, a small um, a landscape item to a job with just their Ford F-150 that they drive every single day. Well, that driver of that vehicle towing that large, um, that large trailer, 
is going to be over 10,001 pounds, so they may need to do hours of service. It just depends on a few more things, so I'm going to talk about that. The biggest thing is interstate versus intrastate. So interstate commerce occurs when uh, what you're shipping, so the cargo is, is crossing a state or, or a country line. Um, that cargo is then interstate um, as soon as it leaves the shipper, the shipper and when it gets to the destination. So if, if you're driving it to the border and then transferring it to another, another vehicle who's then going the rest of the way, because the cargo is actually transferring across the state but not you, well, that's still interstate commerce. Intrastate commerce is when the cargo or the services that you're giving uh, remain in, in one single state. And that's important because if you're operating in intrastate commerce only, then the federal hours of service regulations from the FMCSA and the DOT do not apply to you. However, most states have regulations that are similar or even identical to the federal regulations. So just because you're doing intrastate doesn't mean you don't need to have any hours of service at all potentially, but you would have to look to see if your state then requires any kind of hours of service. Uh, now, the federal is always going to trump the state, so uh, a lot of our customers, just as an aside, will have all of their drivers on a federal rule and be using federal hours of service just because they then don't have to worry whether it's going across the state or not. So an ELD, so an ELD is an electronic logging device. What that device is, it's a device that's attached to the CMV to talk directly to the engine and help record hours of service. Now this is uh, the biggest difference here is because now we're actually getting considerably more accurate recording of all the driving activity because we're connected to the vehicle and we know when it is driving. Um, the big basis to the big ELD mandate is just making sure that when the vehicle is moving, that we know the human that's actually moving it, and then we can apply that time, that driving time, into their hours of service automatically. That's the big crux of the, the ELD. That's the most important piece is who's driving the vehicle when it's moving. If it's moving, it's gotta have a human behind the, the, the wheel. We're not quite there with autonomous vehicles yet. So who drove it? Who's gonna take those hours and put them in and be reflected in their hours of service? So, we need to worry about ELDs. If you have to use hours of service in your interstate commerce, uh, you're over 10,001 pounds, you're transporting hazardous materials, or you are um, over, uh, you're carrying more than 16 or more passengers, you need to have an ELD. Basically, if you need to have hours of service, you need to have uh, an ELD. But there is one caveat that's the very bottom point here is that if you need to have hours of service, but it's for eight days or less in a rolling 30-day period, you don't need to have an ELD. So if you are a driver and you only do, let's say, intrastate commerce when you are working the weekends and you only work, let's say, seven or eight days in, in a 30-day period, you don't need to have an ELD. The hours of service still applies to you on those days, but you can still maintain a paper record of duty status. So you don't have to have an ELD in that particular vehicle. Now this means that there's been non-traditional targets swept up in this mandate. Obviously going back to what we saw before with the big tractor trailer, it was obvious, yeah, those guys are definitely gonna need ELDs. But that landscaping company, they might need an ELD if they load a truck in one state and then do the actual service in another. So here's a case where they're you know, getting mulch and material in Cincinnati, Ohio, but then they're doing the work across the state line in Covington, uh, Kentucky. That's, that's gonna be uh, inter, uh, interstate, so now they need an ELD. Construction, it happens a lot too because you might need to go across state lines to pick up material like drywall in Kansas City, Missouri, and then you actually are building walls in a house in Kansas City, Kansas that's interstate. Commercial HVAC is being swept up in this as well due to their size and sometimes the, the hazardous material piece. Um, a company that hauls large amounts of Freon, they might need an ELD as well because again, that hazardous placard piece. So there are lots of cases where you may need an ELD where you didn't used to uh, because of this the, the way that the mandate's written. Now on that note, if you have any questions about whether or not you should have an ELD or just use record, records of duty status on paper like you maybe always did before, the very best option is to go onto the FMCSA website and look up the field office for your state. 
Every state has a field office. You can give them a call. You can talk to them about your specific scenario. They're the one who is helping to educate all of the inspectors inside of that state. They're the ones who would uh, would be able to answer your questions specific to your state, the federal rules, and your specific scenario. There are lots of niche and edge cases, so definitely if you have questions on whether or not you need an ELD, if you have any questions about that piece, uh, definitely reach out to the local field office because they are directly representing uh, the FMCSA and you'll get the best answer directly from there. If you need to have an ELD, so you've gone through the process and you need hours of service and you're doing interstate, so you need an ELD, you do have to look at one other piece and that's the exemptions because there's a lot of them. The traditional exemptions that, that most people know of are the short haul. So if you are operating within 100 or 150 miles of your home base, regardless of whether you cross a state line or are 10,000 pounds or more, you may be eligible to use the short haul exemption, which means you can keep doing paper for your record keeping. And it's not even hours of service. The short haul is actually an exemption from hours of service and therefore ELDs. You don't have to keep uh, paper records of duty status at all. Um, there's a few other, other pieces to the short haul that you need to make sure that you, uh, that you maintain, but you don't have to worry about ELD. Um, there's also certain exemptions inside of verticals. So utility companies, concrete companies have some exemptions, construction has some exemptions, oil and gas has some too. Now these types of exemptions, you still have to have um, hours of service, but you've got specific exemptions within those rules. You basically have special rules that apply to that particular industry because the regular rules would be prohibitively negative to the actual company. Then you've got uh, some exemptions that are actually baked right into the ELD mandate, like adverse weather. If you were driving along the road and you hit a tornado, obviously you had no idea that was going to be in your path, um, you can extend some of your hours of service to, uh, to still get the job done but make sure obviously to stop for the tornado and let it pass first and then drive. Um, and then as well, the last one is anything that's pre-2000. So this one's baked into the ELD mandate as well. So that's why vanilla ice is on the screen in the bottom right hand corner. Anything that's pre-2000, so if you have an engine that's 1999 or older inside of your vehicle, even if the rest of the vehicle is newer than 1999, so those are called glider kits. In those cases, if your vehicle has an engine that's 1999 or older, you don't need an ELD because you can't actually have an ELD. These vehicles don't have the technology to transfer the data that the ELD needs. So in those cases, you would just be using paper records of duty status or maybe an electronic logbook, but not an ELD. In those cases, you want to make sure that you have proof in your cab that your vehicle has a 1999 engine or older. You want to have you know, pictures of the serial numbers and, and things like that because if you are in a glider kit, I can guarantee you that the officer is not going to simply believe you that you have a 1999 motor. So make sure that you have some proof there. If it's an actual 1999 model truck, so some of those like old Kenworths, you know, like Optimus Prime looking types of vehicles, those guys, uh, it's obvious that those are pre-2000. Uh, so those vehicles, if they are still um, safe and, uh, and operable on the road, they don't need ELDs. You can just go with regular hours of service on paper. Now there's also other parts of compliance in this world as well. Hours of service is just one. There are other parts of compliance and obviously lots of different things that you might need to comply with outside of this like a DVIR. So those are those daily vehicle inspection reports. You essentially have to make sure that your vehicle is safe to operate every single day. IFTA, so that is on the international tax agreement so that you can uh, tell different states how much you drove in each one of the states so that they can share tax revenue. Those are other pieces that you may want to keep an eye on. Uh, and the reason we mention it here is because inside of our solution, we, also, we do all three. So we do hours of service, DVIR, and we also can help with IFTA. So in, in our case, more of like a one-stop shop idea so that uh, you don't have to worry about gathering all this extra data from lots of different places. But one important thing to also make note though is, is that when you talk about hours of service and DVIR, they are usually talked to together, but they are separate. The, the DVIR piece, it doesn't have to be electronic at all. There's nothing that says that it has to be done electronically. You can still do it on paper or some other system. It's a completely different law than the ELD law. But it is something that we have combined pretty tightly inside of our solution because 
they do kind of come hand in hand. So just some other screenshots of, of our specific solution. So there's what Geotab Drive looks like if you haven't seen it before. Uh, so you can see those acronyms again, off and sleeper birth and drive and on. Just to kind of give you a little sense of what it actually looks like. If you want to go and look into all of the regulations, CFR 395 is the one that is actually all of the legalese to do with the ELD mandate. So I have a link here if you if you want to uh, to read it over. It is a pretty good read, actually. Uh, obviously, as part of my job, I've read the entire thing uh, multiple times. It is a good place to go if you if you want to get questions um, answered directly off of the source material. But again, you could also go to uh, your local field office and get some help there. But it is good to at least have a sense of what's inside of this law so that if you are at a roadside stop or if one of your drivers is at a roadside st stop, you know what's in the actual law. There is a bit of a learning curve for both drivers and inspectors right now. We're still only about a month and a half in to this new law. So there are going to be some questions about, and it's good if you have a little bit of knowledge as to what's in the actual law. So it links there, and it's, uh, it's not a very, very bad read at all. So what we want to talk about is the hours of service limits, um, and we'll talk about that before we actually talk about the ELD. Because remember, the ELD is simply another way of capturing your hours of service limits and showing them to the inspector, to the law. The hours of service limits haven't changed since they were actually first conceived. So there, there's only a couple little tweaks that have made since the 80s. The ELD does not change them whatsoever. So anybody who's been driving for, for years, they actually recognize everything that's inside of, uh, of the system, and it's not something that is, is foreign to them. This isn't something new. Uh, hours of service, it hasn't changed. It's simply just another way to capture them. But we're going to talk about one of the most common rule sets inside of the federal hours of service rules, which is the 60-hour, seven-day rule set. Now, what the rule set basically does is it puts in a specific amount of time that you're allowed to work and allowed to drive per day, and it also tells you how much time in the entire cycle you can work. So that's the 60-hour, seven-day part. So in this particular example, and again, there's many different rule sets. We're going to focus on just the 60-hour, seven-day, just the kind of plain one for now. This one has different numbers inside. So in the 60-hour, seven-day, first off, you have a seven-day cycle. So every seven days, you can work a maximum of 60 hours. Now, within every day, you can work 14 hours. Basically, your, your day starts and you have 14 hours that you can then do your driving in. Now, inside of that 14 hours, the maximum amount of driving you can do is 11 hours. And you have to make sure that you take a break within eight hours of starting your day if you want to keep on driving. Now, the other thing to think of as well, and just as a point, the FMCSA is really only worried about the driving time, which is why we see driving a bunch of times in the bullet points at the bottom of the screen here. The FMCSA is not too worried if you pull a 24-hour day. That's, that's not against the actual rules. It is if you try to do more than 11 hours of driving, though. All of the rules and all of the exemptions inside of all of the documentation is always written out from the perspective of you driving. So it's always something like, you can't drive if your day started 14 hours ago. You can't drive if you've already done 11 hours of driving. You can't drive if you haven't taken a break. That doesn't mean that you can't, you can't, you have to stop working once you hit that limit. It just means you have to stop driving. So violations as well, and that's something we're not gonna talk about a lot, but just as a point, Violations are only when you actually drive. So you can only break a rule when you are driving, and which is kind of a, a point to talk about a little bit, simply because in our system it does that. It, it won't actually tell you you're breaking a rule until you drive. But if you're working and you've got to work in the yard for an extra hour after you've done your 11 hours of driving, that's okay. So that, something like that is something that's kind of good to know is that it's always the driving side that has potential violations. So if you haven't seen it, this is what a paper log looks like. There's lots of different variations of them out there, but this is what a driver used to be doing. So up until December of uh, last year, 
paper logs were still in existence. Uh, they're, they're completely gone now. No one uses them unless you have one of those exemptions, like I mentioned. But a paper log has a, a little graph in the middle. And on that graph is actually where you would be going into those different statuses, off-duty, sleeper birth, driving, on-duty. You would have a lot of extra writing to do as to where you were and what you were doing. You'd have a lot of math to do. On the far right-hand side, you have to do all that math to get, to get all those numbers. You have to put in all this information about your vehicle, about your driver's license, your employer number, uh, the trailer that you were, you were hauling, the shipping that you were doing, fill out a bunch of dates, sign it, and keep all of these in a safe place for up to six months. It was just a ton of work. As well, when you got pulled over, you handed this giant stack of paper to the officer, and then the officer then had to manually go through to make sure that you were you were running perfectly fine. If you're running legal, you know, wouldn't it be nice if there was just an easy way for you to just say, yeah, I'm running legal, click a button, get that confirmation, and continue with your day? Well, if I was a driver, and, and I'm not getting paid when I'm sitting there waiting for the officer to tell me that I'm legal or not, yeah, I would love a way to just get that inspection done as fast as possible. So that's one, some of the things that the ELD now does. So the ELD basically takes all of this information that we have on the screen and electronifies it. Um, and, and when you look through a, a proper ELD solution, you should be able to see the same things that you see here in different parts of that solution. If, uh, if it's missing something, it may not be ELD compliant. So let's talk about hours of service and that 60 hour seven day and the logic behind it a little bit more. So the USA property 60 hour seven day, you've got 60 hours to work in seven days. That's the, the maximum number of days the driver is able to complete the maximum number of hours in that cycle. Now there is a way that you can restart your cycle and that's with a 34 hour off duty consecutive period that then resets your cycle back to uh, to basically zero. Um, that is completely optional as well, not something that you necessarily have to uh, to give your drivers, but it is something that a lot of drivers do take advantage of, especially if they're working something like Monday to Friday or they have a five day week uh, over the weekend or over their two days off, it resets their cycle so they don't have to worry about doing any more math. But it is completely optional. Now that 14 hour duty limit, this is usually thought of a daily limit, but it's not based on a 24 hour period. It starts when you actually start work. So it essentially starts when you remove yourself from your off duty. So if you've been off duty for the weekend and Monday you report for duty at something like 8 a.m., that would be the start of your 14 hour duty limit. It's also thought of as a consecutive limit so the 14 hour consecutive um, is, is this particular limit because once it starts, it doesn't stop. It ticks down and there's nothing that you can do to actually stop that number from reaching zero in 14 hours. And this is something that the ELD enforces much uh, better than a paper log. So for example, there are some cases where you've got a very large yard, big shipping company, very large yard. You've got trucks on the, on one side, trailers on the other. Sometimes the trucks and the trailers aren't in the same yard. Maybe the trailer hasn't arrived yet from the previous trip or the, tra the, the truck is still in maintenance. If a driver shows up and starts his day, but then realizes he's got to wait for three hours for the trailer to get there or for the truck to get repaired, those three hours can't be stopped. So it's an important point just uh, when we talk about ELDs is to make sure before you actually start your day and you go into on duty and you, you tell the, the ELD that you're starting, make sure that you can actually start your day because once it starts, there's nothing to stop that 14 hours. It's going to tick down uh, from, the, from the beginning uh, of that, uh, that, that status, that, that on or driving status. Once you run out of those 14 hours, you can't drive again until you go and do a daily restart, which is 10 hours of off-duty. So here's an example. If you've had 10 hours off-duty off, uh, off duty and you come to work at 6 in the morning, um, 14 hours from there is 8 p.m. So at 8 p.m., which is 14 hours later, you cannot do any other driving. There is there's no, nothing you can do to get more driving time back once 8 p.m. hits unless you take another 10-hour break. So there's, there's no way to extend um, that 14-hour duty limit when you do take breaks in the middle of it. Like I said, once it starts, the only way to get another 14 hours back is to do that 10-hour that daily restart. Now, one other thing I'm going to note, too, for anyone who is familiar with the split sleeper birth uh, provision and the sleeper birth provisions, 
we're not going to talk about in these examples. So there is, if you, if you do have a vehicle with a sleeper berth attached to it, I'm not going to talk about any of that slit sleeper berth or the sleeper berth provisions when it comes to the 14-hour duty limit. But for anyone who does want more information on that, I'm either under a question and we can get back at it a little later, or you can check with the FMCSA on the provisions around sleeper berth because it does modify some of the 14 hours a little bit. Okay, so within your 14 hour consecutive period, you then have 11 total hours that you can be behind the wheel. Once you've driven a total of 11 hours, you've, you've reached your, your maximum. Again, the only way to get more hours is to do that 10 hours consecutive off before driving again. So in the same type of example, you've got 10 consecutive hours off, so you come to work at 6 a.m., can't drive after 8 p.m., so during that 6 to 8 p.m. window, you can do a maximum of 11 hours of driving. The last one we'll talk about before getting into some examples is the eight-hour limit. So the eight-hour limit is sometimes known as the break limit or the rest limit. And this is a newer addition. This wasn't in the original hours of service. This one came in a little later. Um, and it's a bit of a bone of contention because now that you have to take this break, the ELD will obviously flag you for a violation if you don't take it. There are going to be times where drivers planned on taking their break at the rest stop, you know, eight hours down the road. But when they get there, all of the other drivers were taking the break at that same rest stop and there's no parking. So there's definitely going to be some issues um, and drivers may need to modify the way that they, they traditionally would take their breaks because now other drivers aren't going to be able to fudge this. Other drivers aren't going to be able to push, you know, an extra 15 minutes or an extra hour down the road because the, the ELD is going to know that they missed that break. So keep that in mind if you're driving, you might need to shorten up your rest break. Um, but do also keep in mind that this particular rule is every eight hours, you have to make sure that you take 30 minutes. So if you start your day in the morning, work for an hour, and then take your 30-minute break, that's not going to really help you because eight hours later, you're going to have to take another one. And you probably don't want to take more breaks than you have to. So keep that in mind that it's usually a good idea to take your break somewhere in the six to eight-hour mark of your consecutive time um, so that you only have to take one during your 14 hour window. Uh, speaking of that 14 hour window, this 30 minute break time does count towards the 14 hour driving window. So that 14 hour driving window um, really becomes a 13 and a half because you have to take this 30 minute break at least once in there. So here's an example kind of, kind of combining everything together. If you've had 10 consecutive uh, hours off, you come to work at 6 a.m., you do some work around um, in paperwork or you're, you're, you're in, the, uh, in the yard, and at 7 a.m. you start driving. So you drive from 7 a.m. until 2 p.m. because 2 p.m. is eight hours since you started work. It's eight hours into consecutive. You have to take a 30-minute break at 2 p.m. if you want to keep driving after 2 p.m. Now, you don't have to take it at 2 p.m., unless you want to start driving right away. You could, you could go off duty and take your break at 2 p.m. Or maybe by the time that 2 p.m. arrives, you're at the other the customer's yard and now you can go on duty. So you can go on duty for maybe an hour because you're loading. But you have to remember, you have to take that off duty before you can start driving. Because if you were to take that on duty for an hour and, and then not do your off, it's going to flag you for a violation. So you don't have to take that 30 minute break right at that eight hour mark, but you do have to make sure that you take it before you start driving again after the eight hour mark. That's the key. But if you do take it at 2 p.m., at 2.30, you jump back in the, in the vehicle, you can drive for another four hours because you used uh, seven uh, in the morning. And then you can drive all the way until 6.30 because then you've used up your whole 11 hours worth of driving. And both of those will come back if you take um, your 10 hour consecutive. Now you can do other work after that 6.30, but you can't do any more driving of a CMV on a public road. Like I said before earlier, you could work longer than that 14 hours. That's perfectly fine for you to do other type of work, but you just can't do driving. Uh, the 60-hour limit is a rolling limit, so it floats. Basically, when you look at the current day and then the previous six, those are your seven days, the day before, so in this case, the previous Thursday would drop off and is no longer inside of your cycle. So you don't necessarily have to do a, a reset. So some drivers don't actually do a 34 hour reset at the end of each cycle. Um, they manage their time and they can actually do consecutive. So they can basically just uh, link seven day periods together. And uh, because the earliest of the times uh, fall off, 
you can continually roll your cycle forward. So resetting your hours within the day, 30 minute break will reset your hours. The 11 and 14 will reset when you have 10 hours off. And if you got to reset your whole entire limit, you need to take 34 hours off. And as I said earlier, it is optional, not mandatory. You don't have to have uh, a restart as, um, as a piece of your rule set if you don't want it. I think we probably talked about this a little bit uh, already, but off duty is off duty. You're not doing anything for your carrier. You're not doing any work at all. It's basically your own time. That's off duty. On duty is any time that you're working and being compensated. Sleep or birth, very similar to off duty, but that's when you can actually have time to yourself inside of, of your cab. And drive is that's when you're actually operating the CMV. You're behind the wheel. So some of these questions and examples here, actually, these are directly from the FMCSA. The FMCSA has a nice slide deck of about 50 different examples from different states and industries and exemptions that you can look through. These are just some of them. This is what the FMCSA officers had to do at the roadside using your paper logs up until December when the ELD mandate took effect. So they'd actually have to come in and look at your logs and start looking at different things for violations. What they would do is they would find what's called a calculation point. A calculation point is when your day started. So that's when that consecutive 14 hours started. And then in this case, they'd count forward to 14 hours. And you'll see that in that 14 hour window, the driver stopped doing any kind of work and went into off duty. So that's a check mark, they're okay there. Then they'd have to look and see how many hours of driving they did. So we can see there's 10 hours of driving here, that's okay. They took a break as well within that for within that day. Um, so it's within the eight hours of starting the day. So that's okay as well. So in this case, there are no violations. That's pretty cut and dry, not too hard to do. But imagine the officer having to do that seven to eight times while you're sitting at the roadside. And then look at some more examples here that are a little more complicated. And imagine having the officer having to do this while you're waiting on the side of the road, maybe idling, using gas, not being able to get on the road, maybe missing appointments, not getting paid. We'll get to that in a second, but look at some of these other examples. Our calculation point, we have one of them here, and that's a 14 hour window, and only 10 hours of driving, took a break, okay, so the first part of the day is okay. Then you looked at day two, well day two, now you gotta see if they took a, took a consecutive time off, well they did, so they had, an hour in the off duty, an hour in sleeper birth from yesterday, and then seven hours of sleeper birth today. Okay, so that checks out. We got 10 hours there. So the day started and then it ended 14 hours later. Like you can kind of see this gets pretty tough to do. And imagine linking seven of these together. So in this case, there's also no violations in between these two days. So no violation either. Now the example here is, I mean, they're again pretty cut and dry, but these can be something that that would just take up a ton of time. So here's another example here. So we've got our calculation point and they drove beyond the 14 hour window. So right away, we know that there's a violation. They also drove for 12 hours, which is another violation, four and four and four, 12 hours. So they did one hour too much of driving. Now violations also get more expensive the longer that they're enforced for. So driving for an, an hour too long, not bad. But if you drove for two, three, or four hours too long, the violation cost actually stacks up and eventually they actually start to double. Um, so it can get very expensive if you have long violations. Uh, now in this case, they at least took a break, so that was okay. So two different violations in this case uh, for both driving and workday. Now, finally, the last example here, here's our calculation point for 10, they've had 10 hours off duty, so that checks out. 14 hours, okay, so they went back into off-duty 14 hours later. Driving's okay too, we got five, four, and one, so 10 hours driving there, but there's no break. So because there was no break here, that's another violation. So all of the driving time that occurred after that, those five hours worth of driving time after that, those are that would combine into a five-hour violation. And that's why I mentioned before how it can get very expensive when you have violations that are long. So just by missing that 30 minute break, they turned that violation into quite a large expense because it's five hours long. So that's an example of another, not not quite, uh, not, not a good thing to do. You, you don't want to have these types of violations. They, they impact you in the pocketbook, but they also impact your, uh, your safety scores as well, which can impact um, who ships with you and things like that.
Now, I've mentioned exemptions a little bit as well. Um, exemptions are basically ways that you work outside of the standard rule sets. So there are a couple that are actually baked right inside of the ELD mandate to help drivers work a little bit better. Anytime that you're driving inside of a, a customer's yard or your yard, basically not a public road, that could be something that's classified as yard move. That counts as on-duty time, not driving time. And that helps because sometimes yards are pretty big and you might be making a lot of stops in these yards. You might spend an hour of driving just in these yards. You can use yard move and it counts only as your on-duty, not driving time. So it kind of maintains your driving. Uh, personal conveyance, a lot of times, especially owner operators, they're gonna be driving their vehicles home or to hotels after they make their deliveries. You can use personal conveyance, which actually lets you move the vehicle, but it counts as off-duty time. So that's also useful, again, maintaining the fact that you don't have to count that you know, 30 minutes that you have to drive home as actual driving time. Um, this is currently actually something that might get tweaked a little bit by the FMCSA, um, but uh, generally it's used when you are off duty and not benefiting your carrier at all. So for example, if you finish up a load and your carrier says, hey, if you go to that hotel over there, it's closer to your load next uh, for tomorrow morning, that couldn't be used as personal conveyance because you're still benefiting the carrier by moving closer to the next place um, uh, that you're going to pick up. So you do have to watch out for that, but there's currently an open comment period on personal conveyance, so we'll probably get something from the FMCSA most likely by the end of next month that might clarify some questions. There's also some other exemptions. There's one called the 16 hour, which gives you an extra two hours of consecutive time in the day. Adverse driving conditions does the same, gives you two hours of, uh, of extra consecutive time. Doesn't give you any extra driving time, but it does give you a bit of extra consecutive uh, hours. Uh, weight it well is an oil specific one, which basically lets you take your break, but it doesn't count towards your consecutive time. And the 24 hour restart is another exemption which shortens your restart by 10 hours. And there's a lot of industries that use that. Oil uses it, construction uses it. it basically means you can turn around a little bit faster than normal. Uh, we actually support all of these within our solution, uh, plus more coming down the pipeline. And it's, it's kind of important to have these inside of your ELD that you choose because it does make hours of service a little bit easier uh, specifically to those industries that have these exemptions. You want to make sure that your ELD reflects it because it's a lot easier when your ELD is helping your driver know when he needs to stop driving or what hours he has. That's the whole purpose of the ELD is to make it a little bit easier for the driver too. If your ELD doesn't support these, your driver is going to have to do these things manually in their head, which is no better than having it on paper. So watch out for that. So where does Geotab Drive come into this? Essentially, it's the driver's one-stop shop for hours of service, for DVIR, for, for everything that they used to go to their, their binder with paper logs for, they would now go into Geotab Drive. So in this example here is, is a driver just starting the day, so they have eight hours left where they can drive because it knows with a 60-hour, seven-day limit that they need to take a break in that uh, within those eight hours before they can drive again. Um, it knows that, it's, that that driver has a total of 11 hours of driving, 14 hours of workday, and a cycle of 60. So all of the math that the driver used to have to do is now done automatically by the system. So it's going to, at every second of every day, give them that snapshot. So as soon as they sign in for the day, they know exactly what their numbers are. They don't have to do the math anymore. Um, the other big piece that Geotab Drive does, and this is part of the ELD mandate, is when you do have an inspection, there's a button that you press to send all the information to the FMCSA. They check it in their system and give you a check mark. It's much, much faster to pass your inspections, at least on the hours of service side, because you no longer have to worry about that officer doing manual calculations on a piece of paper at the roadside. It's, it's much quicker. Um, it's also a lot easier for drivers to maintain their records of duty status because a lot of the activity inside of the system is automatic because we link to the vehicle. Vehicle tells us when we're driving around, so it automatically knows when to put drive logs in. It's a lot faster for the driver to use uh, an, an electronic logbook um, and an ELD uh, simply because they don't have to worry about uh, doing all that pencil pushing and, and the math manually. That's it for what I was planning on talking about. So Ben, if you've got questions that have come through that uh, we may be able to answer, 
shoot them on over. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Kyle. Thank you for presenting. The first question I'll throw at you here is the 10 uh, consecutive hours off duty to restart. I uh, had a question about split sleeper birth. Uh, would you mind getting into that a little bit and explaining what that is and how it works? Well, there's actually two uh, two parts to the sleeper birth provision. The first is that if you go into your sleeper birth for eight hours, it actually suspends your 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 consecutive time. So that's one of the reasons I didn't want to get into it in some of the examples before. But that's the first piece of sleeper. So if you do have the advantage of being able to go into a sleeper birth for eight hours during your day, those eight hours don't count towards consecutive. So it does give yourself a little bit more uh, flexibility. On top of that, there's also something called the split sleeper. Now, the split sleeper basically allows you to accumulate 10 hours of off-duty slash sleeper time in two different slices, in an eight-hour and a two-hour. They combine into 10. But it means that you can basically do work in between those two. And uh, without getting into a, a ton of detail, the split sleeper is uh, very effective if used correctly in basically being able to work not not quite, I don't want to say more, because you're still operating with the same 24 hours in a day. You're still operating with the same 14 and 10, but it gives you more flexibility as to when you work. Uh, a lot of drivers do like that ability to be able to go into the sleeper berth for two hours and then come back out feeling a bit, bit refreshed, work for a few hours, and then take the remaining of the eight come out of that. So it does work very well for drivers who have that ability. It also works very, very well with team drivers. So team drivers can then combine this, the split sleeper and the sleeper berth provision and, and basically kind of tag team driving and the vehicle can, can move a lot further in the same 24 hour period than if you just had a single driver. Now, the split sleeper provision is being looked at by the FMCSA currently as to maybe making a change and allowing to be different uh, numbers rather than eight and two, maybe do like a five and a five or a seven and a three or a one and a nine. So they're looking at uh, public comments on that right now. But for now, it's an eight and a two. Uh, our system does support that as well. So if you do go into sleeper birth for eight hours, you'll notice at the end of the eight hours, uh, your consecutive time gains all of that time back automatically. And if you do a split sleeper as well, you'll actually notice that your calculation points move uh, correspondingly. Basically, every time that you come out of your split, your, your split, it'll recalculate back to the end of your last split. So it does that correctly too. So we don't have to, uh, really enough time to go through more details on that, but we'll be coming out with videos and blog posts around some of these more not so complicated, but more fringe scenarios of hours of service in the coming months. Great. So I've uh, just so everyone knows, I've I've put a couple links into the uh, chat box and go to webinar. Uh, the first link I put in there earlier is a list of field offices for the FMCSA in the United States. Uh, Kyle mentioned that earlier in the presentation as being excellent resources that are there to help you. So uh, questions you're encouraged to reach out to them. I've also put in a link to today's presentation, so the slide deck that uh, that Kyle was showing you, you now have a link to that as well for your own reference. Kyle, there was a question about, or you brought up a little bit, 24-hour restart. Would, would you mind speaking about that for a moment, just sort of what that is and how it operates? Sure. Essentially, if you enable a 24-hour restart or if you if you are eligible to use it, when you do your calculations to restart your cycle, you can look for just a 24-hour consecutive period of off-duty instead of a 34-hour consecutive period of off-duty. So it basically lets you get back to a, a blank slate, to a, a new cycle, 10 hours faster than someone who is not able to use it. Now, it is restricted to specific industries, so not everybody can use it. So it is specific to, uh, to things like construction and, if I, if I ramble off the top of my head, construction, oil, uh, cement trucks can use it, but there are exemptions to hours of service that are industry specific. So if you're in a specific industry, one of the best places to go as well, just as another note, if you're in an industry, there's usually industry associations that you belong to. Reach out to to that because that industry association will know if there's any ins and outs or differences that you might be able to take advantage of two hours of service. And they're also a really good place to go if you want to try to make a change to the hours of service rules. You'll you 
exemptions are, are something that are in the news a lot. If you look at where exemptions come from and request for exemptions, they're usually driven by some association. Like the one that just came out uh, a couple weeks ago is for the Motion Picture Association of America. The one for rental trucks that came out uh, before the mandate came down was from the, the Truck Leasing Association, uh, Trala. So reach out to your associations for help as well on, on things like hours of service if you think there might be something specific to your industry that you can take advantage because they will know for sure. And if you want to try to get with anyone else in your association to maybe try to get an exemption for something, starting at the association is a good idea too. Would a driver be non-compliant if he only took his 10 consecutive hours off duty? Must there be some hours in sleep or birth in order for him to be in compliance? No. No, the driver does not have to enter sleep or birth as long as they're a combination of off-duty or sleep or birth for 10 consecutive hours. That's all that's required. Kyle, anything to add to that? Uh, nope, that's it. As I said before, with the split sleeper and the sleeper birth provisions, if you have the option to use a sleeper birth, uh, definitely do some research into it because it may be advantageous in some areas. If you if you got it in the truck, if you paid for it, you might as well look at uh, how you can use it to your advantage. But if uh, if you're a day cab driver or you're you're driving a vehicle that doesn't have a sleeper berth, that's that's okay. You would just be using your 10 hours consecutive as off duty. But Otherwise, you can consider sleeper birth as off-duty time. If it's not more than eight hours, then you aren't using any special sleeper birth provisions. It's just basically off-duty time. Can you briefly discuss when email will be enabled to send roadside logs? That's been on for a few weeks. All right. Yeah, so, so that's on the ELD side and Geotab Drive. So there's two different ways that you can send the logs into the FMCSA. I do want to stress that functionally, they're identical. The information that is actually sent to the FMCSA is the exact same, no matter what button that you press. There does seem to be inspectors that prefer using the email button. We don't know why, because once it gets into the FMCSA system, it's identical. The, trust me, there is no difference to what we send, whether you click the email button or the web service button. But uh, it is turned on now. The reason that it, it took a little longer to, to turn that on is because the FMCSA didn't let us test anything. And when they finally actually let us test it, we were able to say, yeah, everything works, and then, then turn it on for everybody. But we didn't want to turn it on until they let us test it because we didn't want people to be clicking it and having it fail because they didn't allow us to test. But it's on now, and you can use either one. Uh, use the one that the officer asks you to first. If you do get any kind of error, try the other one because again, there's no difference to the information that's getting to the officer. And remember, if for some reason both of them fail, you do have the display option. So you have the generate option inside of options that shows all of the right information, 100% legal. Um, it's right in the law that says if you can't for some reason do a transfer, the display option is absolutely perfectly fine. Great. At uh, this time, uh, I'm not seeing any more questions coming through, and we're also about out of time. So, uh, Kyle, thank you very much for your time today and uh, for presenting. Thank you all very much for joining us today on Wildcard Wednesday. We appreciate it and hope everyone has a great day and a great week.